thank you all for having me here. I've um, never been as far away from home as I am now, and I feel really at home here. Uh, things have been developing um, pretty astonishingly as far as trying to help start psychedelic research here in Australia, and I'll talk about that a bit at the end of the talk. I was pretty lucky in that I just recently turned 57, and I'm still pursuing this idea that I had for myself when I turned uh, 18 years old, which was to be a psychedelic therapist. <laughs> and so it's actually uh, still like 10 years away or so. Um, I'm more doing um, work on sick public policies, and hopefully I'll get back to doing more focused individual work. Um, what I'm going to briefly do is go over some of the, uh, the fears that we had to overcome over about 18 years of MAPS's initial history to get to the point where we could start doing the psychotherapy research. And I'm going to explain why we've picked MDMA, why we've picked PTSD, and then how we're trying to work and make it happen. Um, what just happened right before I got on the plane coming here was that one of our donors just told me that uh, he was going to donate a quarter million dollars to our U.S. study in veterans with MDMA for PTSD. Things are starting to really come together in an astonishing way. It's like the center of gravity is shifting a little bit between us trying to um, make things happen and trying to uh, go all over the world to try to do that, and now people are starting to come to us. Um, there was an earlier question about, you know, is this resurgence of psychedelic research around the world in part because people are trying to uh, sort of stick it to the U.S., or did it come, you know, emerging out of the U.S.? And I think it's, um, it's the case that a few people can really make a difference. And so starting in 89-90, the people at the FDA that regulated psychedelic research shifted, and they decided to put science over politics, and we were able to start building on that. Um, we had started a study in Spain, the first MDMA PTSD study ever in the world was in Spain in 2000. Um, and then there was some really good media attention about it, but that alerted the anti-drug authority in Spain, who, motivated also by the U.S., and they ended up shutting the study down for political reasons. So then we kind of had to go abandon our international strategy, go back and make it happen in the U.S., which is um, now really starting to flourish. So our, our general approach is that we work to replace fear with facts. And I looked a little bit about what's going on here in Australia as far as uh, drug education. <laughs> now, we, we call this replacing facts with fear. This was uh, supposedly an ecstasy lab that was you know, made using drain cleaner, battery acid, or even hair bleach, and popped in your mouth. So I sent this to Dave Nichols and to uh, Nick Cozy to try to see, is this really an MDMA lab? Could this have been a meth lab? I mean, how far away from the actual story is this? Um, so Dave said, uh, probably the worst example they could find of a drug lab they had raided and taken a photo of. He said he couldn't tell what it was actually trying to produce. Uh, but Nick Cozy said, I love the way they always throw the battery acid and drain cleaner into the story as if prescription drugs were not manufactured using the exact same reagents, <laughs> which are simply dilute sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide. <laughs> so Nick also sent me some pictures of her actual lab <laughs> that you could have just as easily said that uh, MDMA was, and he has produced uh, some legal substances uh, out of this lab. <laughs> now, this was um, an amusing uh, video. It's a one-minute video from the Australian government. You guys have paid for this, so I think you <laughs> might as well see it. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So uh, either the first person you kind of have a good time, or else you know you die. So this is um, I, you know it's hard to say how effective these are <laughs> because they seem so extreme. Now talk about extremes. This was very widespread image that was on MTV and on Oprah in 2001. This was supposedly a spec scan of an ecstasy user, and it claimed to show that he had, she had these holes in her brain. Now, if she really had these holes in her brain, she wouldn't have been there, but she was actually um, on the TV show, articulate, talking about how uh, this was her brain and she's now cleared up her life. and. So she couldn't be doing those things if this was really her brain. Uh, there was some evidence of brain damage, though, in that she was working for the Partnership for a Drug-Free America <laughs> as a spokeswoman for, you know, how bad. <laughs> and so this is supposedly her brain. And it's amazing how many people actually were scared by this, and this is frightening. Um, this is PET scans, which are from um, research that was done at Johns Hopkins. But you'll, you'll notice that the brain after ecstasy has these sections where it's colored in the same color as the outside. It's like as if there's nothing there. They made millions of these postcards. NIDA did, National Institute on Drug Abuse. And this sort of just created, again, this climate of fear that made it very difficult to get permission to do research. Uh, this is my favorite, though, because this shows the, uh, the dangers of bad staff work. This was, Alan Leshner was the, uh, the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And he was testifying to the Senate Subcommittee on Government Affairs. They were considering the Anti-Rave Act. Now, one of the things the Anti-Rave Act did was criminalize harm reduction efforts. So that if you were um, running a rave or you were uh, having a bar or something like that, if you took reasonable efforts to try to reduce the harms, that was a sign that you knew that drugs were being used there and then they could uh, put you in jail and take away your assets. So it, it's like a harm maximization strategy. But what is being shown here to the senators was a baseline brain. Um, this is, uh, again, a spec where uh, blood flow through brain and hotter colors are more blood flow, more energy, lower colors are lighter. So what this showed is that two weeks after MDMA, there's this change in the negative direction, supposedly less blood flow. It wasn't associated with functional consequences, but um, what Alan Lesher didn't tell the senators was two things. One was that this study also looked at people two months out and they were the same as the baseline. So this is a short-term effect, no functional consequences, and it was portrayed as if it was a, a long-term effect. But what he didn't know, this is the bad staff work, is that we were involved with this study, actually, because our focus is that we have to be the experts on the risks as well as the benefits, that we can't repeat the mistakes that we felt in the 60s where the advocates of psychedelics were exaggerating the benefits and underplaying the risks, and then the opponents were exaggerating the risks and denying all the benefits. So we feel that it's our responsibility to be the experts on the risks as well as the benefits. So we were involved in this study. And this was early on, and the FDA at this time only let people into the study to get MDMA. And these people got um, the spec scans, then they got uh, MDMA, and then they got spec scans again. You could only get into these studies if you were already an ecstasy user, because they didn't want to open up the door to a supposed you know, life of drug abuse for somebody who might be in the study. So that this baseline brain is a heavy MDMA user. <laughs> now, what do I mean by heavy MDMA user? The study that it was based on, average duration of use was 8.6 years, estimated total number of times of MDMA use was 211. So the senators are seeing this baseline brain and it's, a, now we don't know actually which of the people from the study they selected this slide from, but it was just egregious. Right now actually um, on Monday, the American Civil Liberties Union is suing uh, in court to try to say that the ecstasy penalties were made by the sentencing commission in a moment of hysteria that was similar to the way that the crack cocaine penalties were made in a moment of hysteria, and they've been reversed, the crack cocaine penalties, and this is um, part of the evidence that I was using to educate the ACLU lawyers. Now, things have shifted. <laughs> this is among the most positive images of uh, MDMA. This was from our Israeli study where we were uh, having a conference there in Israel try to educate the um, the doctors, the public, the anti-drug authority. And so this is a soldier who is uh, 
holding on as kind of a life preserver to a, a ecstasy pill. Now, of course, we would have preferred that it was pharmaceutical <laughs> rather than a happy face, but this still is like a whole different kind of message. Um, this was uh, an article uh, from an article in the Washington Post, Sunday Magazine. This was a woman who was in our first MDMA PTSD study, and this was just an absolute triumph to have it be called the peace drug. And now here is an actual bottle. This was from the study at Harvard with MDMA for cancer patients, advanced stage cancer patients with anxiety. So this is the kind of image that we're trying to move towards. So I've just now basically telegraphed uh, more or less 18 and a half years of struggle to start the research. So what we're gonna end up with, and this is maybe now um, 15 years from now, is these psychedelic clinics. We talked about them a little bit today. And I think that they, they will be mainstreamed. And um, 1974 was the very first hospice center. And in 2004, there was 3,500. So I think for kind of a social rollout of psychedelic medicine and psychedelic clinics, we can really think in terms of uh, 20, 30 years. And since I've become a parent and watched my kids grow up, my oldest is now 16, it's changed a lot my sense of time. And I'm sure that many of you who are parents have the same sense, is that time goes by like that. And also it's this acceleration of time as we get older. And so now it's a lot easier to think about change in terms of 20, 30 years. It doesn't make me as impatient like I need to see it right now. So I think from this one, this is now Google Maps, <laughs> showing the location of psychedelic clinics all over the country. <laughs> a little bit of imaginary work there. Um, so mostly now I'm gonna talk about why MDMA, why PTSD, um, then we're in a stage where we're doing a series of uh, pilot studies. And these are designed to answer a series of scientific questions leading to the development of large-scale phase three studies. And the phase three studies are the ones that count as proving something in terms of safety and efficacy. So none of what we've done so far is really designed to prove anything conclusively, but it's to gather information. And I'll explain what the questions are and then I'll move into our US pilot study, the first one that we've completed, and the follow-up and how we designed it and what the results are. I'll talk about our international series of studies, and then the current study that we've just started now, that we just got this quarter of a million dollars for, which is the uh, PTSD study in veterans from Iraq, Afghanistan, and a few from Vietnam. And then we'll talk about the possibility of an Australian MDMA PTSD study. So why MDMA? There's a lot of different psychedelics we could have chosen. Uh, now, basically what I'm trying to say is that while we are um, compassionate about patients, wanting to help, that there has to be a fundamental strategic approach that's based on understanding the political dynamics, understanding the social fears, that the work that we're doing is as much or more politically driven than scientifically driven. It has to be, make, it has to totally make sense from a scientific point of view, from a therapeutic point of view, but it also has to have a political understanding built into it. So that, for example, when we think about medical marijuana, um, it really started coming back in the 80s with uh, marijuana for AIDS patients, for AIDS wasting and for nausea control. But again, AIDS patients are the other. And so it's not the way to mainstream as much so we had to pick patient populations and other considerations. So MDMA, one of our fundamental understandings is that if you want to be a therapist to work with psychedelics, that you will be more effective if you've tried them yourself. It's not a requirement, but that if you want to learn yoga, you'll study from somebody that knows yoga. If you want to learn meditation, you naturally go to somebody that meditates. If you want to be a psychoanalyst, you have to go through your, your own psychoanalysis. So with MDMA, it's a gentle but profound drug, and it's easier to integrate than the classic psychedelics. And what that means is that traditional psychiatrists and psychologists are more willing to self-experiment with MDMA than they would be with LSD or psilocybin. So I think that there are a lot of good reasons for research with psilocybin and with LSD and Ibogaine, other classic psychedelics, but MDMA is more likely to be integrated and accepted by psychiatric and therapeutic communities because they are less scared of trying it themselves. 
Also, MDMA has this remarkable ability to reduce a fear response to a perceived emotional threat. And underlying that neurochemically is this uh, reduced activity in the amygdala, in the hippocampus, the fear centers of the brain. But this idea to, to take the natural properties of MDMA to help people work with difficult emotions, which is also why it's good for couples therapy, I think why a lot of people are using it. It's why there's not a lot of negative uh, side effects of people having panic reactions. Um, and then on the positive side, it increases trust and empathy. Um, it's been compared to the post-orgasmic state uh, because of the oxytocin and prolactin release. So that what we learned from the psychotherapy outcome research is that the therapeutic alliance is the key determinant to outcome. That there can be a lot of different techniques that people have, and it's hard to say that this approach is better than that approach, but the underlying thing that has been held in common is this therapeutic alliance. And the more that there's trust and openness, the more progress people can make, and MDMA will help with that. Now, the other part of MDMA that's so good, I sort of alluded to this a little bit before, is that we want to work with demonized drugs. It's again, this is the keto strategy is that if we had to start from the beginning to make a drug into a medicine, that the pharmaceutical industry will tell you it costs a billion dollars to do that. Now, I've looked a lot at those numbers. Uh, half of that is opportunity cost on the money. You don't actually have to pay that. That's just because they're a business. That's what they should be earning, 12% per year. Uh, another major fraction of that is that they amortize all the costs of their failures into their few successes. And we don't need to do that because we're starting with something that from this enormous experimentation that has gone on, that there's a lot of information, a lot of anecdotal reports about therapeutic use of MDMA. We believe that it works. Now, from a scientific point of view, you, you shouldn't necessarily start out by saying, I believe it works, but I think it's fair to say that the purpose of scientific methodology is to get in the way of our own biases. So it's something to disclose. I do believe it works. But the emphasis here has got to be on our methodology to try to make it so that we don't find what we want to find. But once we get past this idea of amortizing all of the failures, then we get into all the safety studies. So if you go into Medline right now and put in MDMA or ecstasy, there's over 3,500 papers at a cost, I've estimated, of over $300 million that have been paid for by governments you know, in addition to the, uh, the movies and the ads that they pay for, there's an enormous body of scientific research that's been trying to understand the neurotoxicity risks of MDMA, how does it work, uh, just incredible. So because these are now in the public domain, we don't have to pay for them ourselves. We can, we've spent about $150,000 to have a, a Ilsa Jerome, who works on our staff, has read all these papers, has summarized them, created what's called the investigator's brochure, which is up on our website. All of this, our protocols, everything is on our website. But we've been able to capture around $300 million worth of research with uh, $150,000 worth of effort. So if it, was, if it was the case that Sasha Shulgin had invented a drug that was better than MDMA at what MDMA does, but nobody had heard of it, if he just came up with it you know, last month in his lab, we would not be able to make it into a medicine because really I think it would be cost prohibitive. But because we have a drug that's been highly demonized and has been widespread in use by you know, tens of millions of people, 100 million perhaps, that we also have an enormous understanding of the safety profile because the one in a million or one in five million, the rare things that happen that you never find out from a pharmaceutical drug because they research it in 5,000 people, 10,000 people, then it gets approved. This is what it was happening with Chantix. You know, a few people have this kind of um, reaction of uh, anger or suicide kind of agitation. It's like very rare, but we know a lot of these rare things as well from MDMA. So MDMA looks like the drug, but then what are we going to do with it? PTSD is what we've chosen, and it's because the current treatment approaches fail to provide the relief in a substantial number of patients. So that's really important. It's, there's a lot of risks that are considered to accrue to MDMA, the drug abuse risk, the neurotoxic risk, but if we can show that there are people for whom nothing else has helped, the risk-benefit ratio changes. There's also an internationally accepted outcome measure, which is the CAPS, which is actually um, translated into multiple different languages. It's, it's really a clear map between the 
disease conditions we're trying to treat and the outcome measure. It's not the case with all the work with psychedelics with end of life. That's why I think LSD, um, psilocybin, the work with people who are dying, it's really important. It's more widespread than PTSD. We're all going to be dying. It relates to everybody. But the kind of existential changes that people go through as they uh, accept and deal with their death are not so clearly mapped on the standard anxiety and depression measures that are used. So it's a harder scientific question, I think, to prove in the language that the FDA and other regulatory agencies use that there has been a positive benefit from the work with end of life. With PTSD, it's not the case because of the caps. It's captured by the outcome measure. And we have this highly sympathetic patient population, veterans, survivors of sexual assault, abuse, accidents, and trauma. So we have PTSD, which is a fear-based disorder. MDMA is a treatment for fear. This $300 million worth of existing research, millions of users. All of this has formed the key of our strategy. That's why this is our top priority. And so far, it seems like this still makes sense. Uh, this has been about a 10-year-old uh, strategy, and uh, fortunately, it, it still seems right. Now, there's a lot of methodological issues that we have to address. And again, I'd like to stress that science is really uh, what we have to have as our bedrock. I mean, I think that's the language that the FDA speaks. It's something that people who take psychedelics, who have spiritual experiences, uh, we heard about new age thinking earlier today, that it's, you know, we're, we're sort of already considered to be flaky thinkers. <laughs> so we really have to be grounding ourselves in the, the state of the art scientific methodology. So the methodological issues that we have to address in all these series of international pilot studies is, the first off is what is our method? The problem is that with an illegal drug, you can't develop your method and then start to test it because you can't get permission. It's, it's, you have to, unfortunately, get permission to do your study and at the same time develop your method. Now, we are learning a lot from uh, the work that was done prior to when MDMA was criminalized, when it was still legal. There's a lot of information from there, but we're still trying to develop our method. We're also still trying to figure out how do we train therapists because we're going to eventually have probably um, 20 to 40 different sites around the world where we're going to have PTSD small studies. When we do the phase three studies, there are multi-site studies and we have to aggregate the data and we have to evaluate to make sure that it's the same therapy that's being done. And so we have to figure out how do we train therapists and then how do we tell that they are adhering to the method. Uh, we videotape and audio tape all of our sessions. We have independent raters that are being trained in our methods. The other thing that we have to do is figure out is the cause of PTSD related to the treatment. Basically, this means is sexual assault and rape so fundamentally different than combat-related PTSD that it's not the same treatment. And if it's not the same treatment, then we can't combine these subjects into the same outcome studies. But if it's different causes, but the treatment approach is the same, then we'll have a lot easier of a time to recruit subjects, to do our large, and our data will then apply to a larger set of people. So our first study in the U.S. was mostly women survivors of sexual assault and rape. Our next study is now in veterans. Uh, we also have to figure out what, how do you do a double-blind study? I mean, you know, if you've ever, uh, or if you know of anybody that's ever bought something that was supposedly active and it turned out to be fake, you know, could you tell? I mean, how is it that we're going to fool people if they get an inactive placebo or they get the MDMA, you know, where does the double blind go? So how do you do a double blind with a psychedelic drug that has very strong acute effects? That's one of the key methodological issues, and we've spent a lot of time working on that. I'll discuss when, once we get into it how we think we've addressed that. Um, we also need to talk about the variance and magnitude of the, uh, of the treatment effect. Basically, it's, if you have a very strong effect, and it happens in almost everybody, from a statistical point of view, you need fewer people to show it. But if you have something that's not such a strong effect, then it works in some people, not in others, and it's, it takes a larger number of people, it will cost us a larger number, a uh, larger amount of dollars to do, and we'll have to have larger numbers of people in our studies. So this variance in magnitude is to help us figure out how to size the studies, and then this question of cultural differences. I mean, that actually is one of the things that's exciting me about an Australian PTSD study is because 
Uh, you speak English here. <laughs> it's a similar culture in a lot of ways to America um, as compared to, for example, our Jordanian study. So we are now working on the development of our therapeutic methods. Again, I said this is up on our website. We have tried our best to describe it. I'll go into it a little bit later, but this is an evolving document and it's um, being used in how we train therapists. So we have now, um, basically our structure is a five-day training program, mostly watching videotapes of prior MDMA sessions and reviewing the treatment manual and the adherence criteria. And we also have been able, this is to show you how much progress we've made in the United States, is that um, it really felt like it was important to provide a legal opportunity for therapists to experience MDMA. Because again, as part of uh, training to be in our studies, there's a, there's a small number of people that have above ground credentials and underground experience. And then we have uh, not quite exhausted that group, that population, but for mainstreaming, we need to be working with people that have never done MDMA before, that have never thought of doing MDMA before, but are interested in helping to do PTSD treatments. And those kind of people will not, you know, come to California, to up in the mountains, and we'll give you an MDMA session and don't tell anybody, and then you can go work on the study. We needed to find a way to get legal permission to do this. And so we approached the FDA with a protocol and said, this is our protocol to uh, give MDMA to therapists. And we just made the case why it was necessary. The FDA came back to us and they said, this is, you have persuaded us that we need to uh, give you permission to do something like this, but the form that you gave it to us in, we can't approve. You know, we're not in the position of just approving protocols to give training sessions to therapists. You have to do a study. You have to make it look like some kind of a study. And so we're like, well, thank you for telling us that. And, and so we designed a study that's looking at the psychological effects of MDMA in normal, healthy volunteers who happen to be training to, uh, to conduct the MDMA therapy. <laughs> Eventually they said yes. So we finally do have permission for doing the study. And then once therapists start working on our studies, we're going to be reviewing the videotapes very closely of the first two therapy sessions that they do, scoring them on the adherence criteria and giving them feedback. So this is our current approach to training. Um, this is this question of is the PTSD related to the treatment. So far we think that um, the treatment is the same despite the cause of PTSD. Um, now for a successful double blind, you can use an inactive placebo, an active placebo, and Actually, dose response is where we're coming. Inactive placebo, the first study that we did was with an inactive placebo. The patients and therapists were able to tell pretty much 100% of the time. So it was an unsuccessful double blind. Um, active placebo means something other than MDMA, like um, maybe Ritalin or maybe um, some other kind of a drug. But there's, there's certain concerns about you don't want to activate people with PTSD with stimulants that don't have any kind of therapeutic potential. Also, it's still possible for trained therapists to tell it apart. And so dose response is the way to go, which means that people in the study all get MDMA but at different doses, and it's more difficult for them to guess what dose they got. So that there'll be a significant number of guesses in error, and if we have like 20% or so guesses in error by patients and by therapists, then it counts as a successful double blind because nobody's quite gaming the system to supposedly maybe give the best treatment to the people that's got the highest dose. So, and this has now pretty much been accepted by the FDA as the likely way to go. Now, in terms of the magnitude, this is the decline in the caps from the U.S. data, just to show you that that's, that's the magnitude, how much does the caps go down. Uh, the Swiss study, this is the individual patients, and you can see that there's a fair amount of similarity between uh, they, where they start, where they end up is slightly less, but it's more or less uniform. So we have uh, a pretty minimal variance and a pretty strong magnitude in the U.S. data. I'll show you later, though, the Swiss data was only half as good as the U.S. data. So that's something that we're still trying to figure out about the cultural differences. There was a dropout in the Swiss study. Um, it was a Turkish person, and he was um, 
accepting the fact he was there because he was involved in a workplace accident, somebody died next to him, he felt responsible for it, and under the influence of MDMA, he was um, really acknowledging his responsibility, but then he just totally freaked out, because the part of Turkey where he was from, uh, they don't really have much in the way of the rule of law, and it's kind of a tribal system, and if you're responsible for somebody else's death, their family has the right to kill you. So that's what he was coming on to, and, and that was just too much for him, and he said, wanted to lead the study. The therapist actually had to go walking with him for a couple hours. But those are the kind of cultural differences that we're looking for to see if we can really do it. This is the paper that we published uh, July 19th in the Journal of Psychopharmacology talking about the results of our U.S. study. The results were actually outstanding. The design was that people were treatment resistant to both pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy. They had PTSD an average of 19 years inactive placebo versus 125 milligrams. And what our approach has been is because MDMA is kind of shorter acting, after a couple hours, um, we have the option, if the therapist and patient want it, to give half the initial dose. And what that does is it extends the plateau of this therapeutic window. And more and more we're finding that, that we are using that. Um, and it's a combination of drug and non-drug therapy. Uh, two to three MDMA sessions with uh, two months and long-term follow-up. This is the uh, therapy room. We, we call it the psychedelic bed and breakfast <laughs> uh, because people are supposed to spend the night. It's actually a remodeled house, which is uh, Michael and Annie's uh, office. Uh, it's really important, we feel, for people to spend the night where they've had the therapy session, and then in the next morning they have integrative sessions, then they go home. Um, this is the diagram of the study. So basically, um, we have a screening at baseline. These red circles, uh, blue circles, I mean, are um, these 90-minute non-drug therapy sessions to prepare people for what's likely to happen. This is where you're building the therapeutic alliance. You're helping people understand about letting go, about um, how it's really going to be, follow your unconscious, how let things emerge. This is preparing them for the session. The triangles are the three MDMA sessions, and then these uh, squares are the non-drug integrated sessions that are one week between. So basically we have three MDMA sessions, three to five weeks apart, and weekly non-drug psychotherapy for integration purposes, and then to prepare for the next. And depending on how long it takes somebody to integrate, we might schedule the second MDMA session to be five weeks, or three weeks, or four weeks. So it's, it's really patient dependent to schedule, but it's more or less similar. And the outcome is two months after the last therapy. And then the follow-up, um, what we did in this first study, because recruitment was slow, we decided that we would wait till we had everybody and then do the follow-up. And that turned out, that when we did the follow-up, that it was an average of 40 months, almost three and a half years after the therapy. And it's very rare that there are uh, follow-ups that long. And what we discovered was that the... Uh, the benefits have sustained. This is just a, a bigger picture. What, what you'll notice here is if you can see the 50 line, that's the 50 or above is moderate to severe PTSD. And you had to have 50 or above to get into the study. And at the end, the average was below 30. So this is a clinically significant drop, so much so that 80% of the subjects no longer qualified for a diagnosis of PTSD after the study compared to 25% in the placebo group. So 80, over 80% 80 to 25%. And of the people in the placebo group, one of them faded after a very short amount of time. And what we then did was all of the people that were in the placebo group could volunteer to go open label, means they know what they were getting, to go through the study again. And then those seven out of the eight all had drops that were comparable to this. So we actually ended up uh, people were both their own controls and then they were match controls. So it was a more sophisticated. This shows how um, the long-term follow-up is even lower than... Now, we lost a few people to follow-up. So that's always an issue. Uh, but we looked at it and where their initial scores were were not uh, significantly different than the, uh, than the average before. So internationally, our SWIFT study... Um, we now started using low-dose MDMA. So this was 25 milligrams as the placebo dose. And um, the MDMA group did benefit, as I said, not uh, quite as much as the U.S. study. And we're working this up for publication right now. There were no serious adverse events, no evidence of harm. The last person is going to be getting the long-term follow-up in January, and we hope to have the paper in April. 
This is um, showing you the CAPS results declining. Um, again, it's um, more or less over 30 somewhat, so you can see it's not the same. The, the red line is the full dose people, and then the uh, lighter color is the um, people who were in the placebo group initially and then went into the MDMA group um, in an open label. So these results are still good. These are better than the results for Zoloft and Paxil, substantially. But I should add that this uh, is much more expensive than Zoloft and Paxil in the short run because it's a uh, male-female co-therapist team. Each person gets around 40 hours of therapy. So times two, it's like 80 hours of therapist time. So it's really a lot. We used another uh, scale, which was meant to be a shorter version than the CAPS. Uh, it showed similar results. We're not using it anymore because it's not as accepted as the CAPS. And we're working with Franz Wollenweider and his team at the University of Zurich on looking at physiological correlates of um, PTSD and how they're changed by MDMA. So everybody in our Swiss study, before they got treated, they got EEG, startle reflex, and heart rate variability studies. And we don't know the results of this yet. Uh, but this was something that Franz paid for. MAPS only paid $5,000 for it. So that, again, we have to target our resources on showing that something happens beneficial. From the FDA's point of view, you don't have to explain why something works. You just have to show that it works. So we're mostly just focusing on showing therapy. Israel was a, a bit of a stretch because we're working with the former chief psychiatrist of the Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, he runs a major, uh, the largest mental hospital for schizophrenics and psychotics in Israel, and it's traditional psychiatrists. And these were psychiatrists that um, not only had never tried MDMA, but didn't want to try MDMA. There was a little bit of, again, that fear of losing control. Uh, but we thought, okay, how much of the magic is in the MDMA? How much of it is in the therapist? Maybe this will help us find out. And what we found out is that uh, the therapists are really key to this project, and that um, they were no serious adverse events, but that the patients reported they felt somewhat better, but we didn't see it in the CAP scores. So we've now shut this study down prematurely, and we're restarting it where we're splitting up the two traditional psychiatrists, and we're bringing in therapists, psychologists, who have more experience personally with MDMA and, and with PTSD. And we'll restart it with a, a different therapy team but with the same psychiatrist as half the team, because again, this part of the trying to mainstream is to teach the traditional psychiatrist. Um, and these were mostly uh, war-related or terrorism-related patients. Um, coming up is in Canada, and we're, we're trying to replicate our results in the US. The Canadians, one of them was therapist was trained by R.D. Lang, the other was trained by Stan Groff. So it's can we replicate the US results in a similar cultural context with similarly trained therapists? Um, 12 subjects is our standard. Uh, here it's going to be 125 milligrams versus 25, three sessions. And we have all the approvals from, for the protocol, but we're waiting on the import permit. And the Health Canada is kind of dragging their feet. This has taken a lot longer than we thought. It's already been a, a year waiting for this import permit. But they run out of excuses, and we're going to keep at it. So this will um, hopefully be approved in the next couple months, but I can't really say for sure. Um, this is the second Israeli study. Um, also in Israel, we're using two sessions instead of three. If we can show that we can help people with two sessions instead of three, we'll save millions of dollars on the big phase three studies. Uh, in Jordan, um, this came about um, ironically because of um, cluster headaches. Um, there were several people from uh, Jordan with cluster headaches who were interested in um, what was going on uh, with cluster headache research, and they came to the U.S. Uh, the study wasn't ready, but they found their way to uh, LSD, and they ended up um, curing their cycle of cluster headaches, and it turned out they were extremely politically well-connected in Jordan. And so I started thinking, as a Jew, as Israeli relatives, you know, maybe we could really do something in an Arab country, and also it would be um, very interesting for us to try to figure out about the cultural differences. And so I've been there now four times. It's been an incredibly healing to me to cross these borders and to work with the chief psychiatrist from the Jordanian army. The psychologist is the chief psychologist for the Jordanian counterterrorism. And to be in Jordan looking back at Israel um, has really turned my world upside down in a lot of different ways. And so um, the Jordanians were explaining, though, that talking about MDMA in Israel and Jordan as kind of a way to build peace, they said in their culture, you know, you need to talk about the Jordanians are competing with the Israelis. 
So now we've got competition for who can work with MDMA the best <laughs> to cure trauma. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a great cut. So this is the Arabic caps, just to show you. We're, we're translating the caps into Arabic, and this will hopefully help start research uh, with PTSD throughout the Arab world. Um, our U.S. study in veterans is, um, again, to see if the cause requires different method. Uh, this looks like our design for the phase three studies. And we got three groups now in this study. We're going to have the low dose, which is 30 milligrams, followed by 15. The, the medium dose, which is 75 milligrams, followed by 37 and a half, and then the full dose, 125, followed by 62 and a half. So there will be a fair amount of confusion, we believe, and we're also starting to bring in higher risk populations, particularly Hep C and controlled hypertension. And we have a fairly um, rich body of evidence from underground work that this, uh, this will work. You, you go to Arrowhead and you can find out a lot of this kind of stuff. So are you a veteran? This is one of the ways that we've used to try to recruit subjects. Actually now we have an abundance of vets. I mean it's really quite sad that there's a lot of vets that are not being well treated. And so we have um, four so far from Vietnam. And we want to see if people who have these long-standing patterns can really be helped and uh, four from Iraq and Afghanistan. And we're also trying to do half female, half male vets as well. Uh, so the timeline to make MDMA into a medicine is um, two to three years to what's called the end of phase two meeting. Now, that's where we bring all of the data from our uh, phase two studies and we say, here's the design that we want to use for the phase three studies. And this is this end of phase three meeting. So that's going to take us a couple years. Once the FDA and the sponsor comes to agreement on what the design of the studies are going to look like, then it's going to be three to five years to finish that, and probably seven or eight million dollars. Uh, and then after you gather all that data, you analyze it, you submit it to the FDA, and that takes them a year or two to review. So we're more or less ten years away from having the first psychedelic made into a prescription medicine. Um, one of the hardest things for me is to go back and read the old maps bulletins and look at my predictions <laughs> for how long things are going to take. So uh, we've had a five-year plan for about five years. Now we have a 10-year plan. We've had this 10-year plan for the last two years. <laughs> but this is, um, you know, we encounter new problems and we revise our... But I think it, it, this, it's getting more and more realistic as we get further and further along. Um, this is just a sad thing to note um, that uh, the, this is the importance of trying to do this as fast as possible. I was contacted by this fellow, Zulfi, who wanted a referral to an underground psychedelic therapist for PTSD. And we talked about it, and he explained how he thought he might have had a stroke, and I started thinking that's not really a safe context for it, um, and I, I didn't refer him on. Um, and then I didn't hear anything for another um, six weeks or so, and then I got a call from the police in his town and said, do you know this guy? And I said, yeah, and, and I talked to him about this, and he said, well, he, he left you a suicide note, which he wrote the day after I talked to him on the phone. Um, he didn't kill himself for like six weeks later, and the last part of this says, he, he, this is this note for me, is in case you want to use this letter in any way possible to help your cause, I may have been one life saved had I access to psychedelic therapy. Now, <laughs> what's the story about Australian MDMA PTSD? Well, I'm here to, to report that MAPS is offering a $25,000 matching grant to uh, support a study in Australia for MDMA for PTSD. <laughs> We've been fairly uh, fortunate with our fundraising efforts and um, we're also offering um, protocol development and approval process, assistance with that, offering help with training the therapists, and then we can uh, oversee the study and monitor it in such a way that regulatory authorities in the U.S. and in Australia will accept the data, because all of our foreign studies get uh, submitted to the FDA as well. So since I've been here, just since yesterday, uh, we've now, uh, thanks to uh, Henry and others that he knows that we have now uh, made the match, so now we have $50,000 to start playing with. Um, and then with Stuart and others, we've been talking about uh, people with uh, veterans here with PTSD, and so we may even have a therapy team here. So things have just been developing at kind of an astonishing rate. There's just a, a real need, and it's like 
coming to the fore right now. So that's uh, where we're at. That's my presentation, and uh, I look forward to being here again. <laughs>
you get a more narrow range of what we're looking for. So that, that, that's the real reason why we do it that way. Um, eventually, of course, we would like there to be um, a little bit more um, flexibility that the therapists have. And the way we've tried to introduce that is in this supplemental dose that comes you know, two hours later, because now we make it that it can come from one and a half to two and a half hours. So that if there's some sense that the dose is a little bit low, um, in our new study in veterans, one of the veterans we're gonna let in is on opiates and for pain. And opiates tend to blunt the effect of MDMA. So if you give the second dose an hour and a half rather than two and a half hours, you might be able to get a little bit of an increase of potency. Around two hours, you keep the plateau going. Two and a half hours, you keep the plateau going. But So we're, we're trying to introduce a little bit of flexibility there. But we had to choose one way, either milligram per kilogram or fixed dosing. We couldn't leave it up to the, the variation of choice of the therapist and patient. So I feel we're pretty comfortable with that. The FDA actually wanted us to justify that when we moved to the patient, and we were able to persuade them that this was a good way to go. I'm, uh, I'm wondering if you uh, have noticed any difference over the last 18 years in terms of the responsiveness and the uh, acceptance on the part of the FDA when it's a Bush type of government versus a Obama, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, Clinton type of government, or is it uh -huh. fairly steady no matter what the political climate is at the time? Uh, it, it is fortunately independent of the uh, bigger political things because basically the, the opening came under the first President Bush. So what we have is a, an agency that is devoted to science over politics in general. The politics comes in once you've done all the research and then you want to make it into a medicine. When it's approved for a medicine, that's where it'll matter more who's in power at the top. Where we most see the political influence at FDA is in women's reproductive rights. So are you 46, the morning after pill, that's where there's major political battles. But again, those come at the point where you've got your data and you're trying to get the drug approved. But at the level of the divisions of the FDA, they're fairly independent. So why was there this blockage of research from you know the early 70s till Rick Strassman got approval in 1990. Um, there are cultural factors. It, it's not laws, it's not regulations, it's the interpretation of the risk-benefit ratio. And that's somewhat subjective. And at the same time, but what really happened was that, in the, and this is a big part of my dissertation, which is up on the website, um, is that the FDA was being accused of, by the pharmaceutical industry of going too slow in reviewing drugs in the middle 80s. And that the, the FDA was seen as an impediment, you know, in this Reagan era for, you know, deregulation. And so the FDA started an experiment. How could they review drugs more quickly? And so they created this group called the Pilot Drug Evaluation Staff. And they were to figure out these new methods. But they had to get some drugs to review. And they had to seize them from other divisions. And, you know, bureaucrats don't want to give up their little areas. So this one group said, hey, we got the psychedelics and marijuana. We've blocked the research for 20 years. We'll give it to you guys. And so they came in there. And, and it, it turned out that from being a draft resistor, from being a drug criminal, from being, you know, myself, thinking of myself that way, then to going to the Kennedy School and trying to see, again, this mainstreaming, I applied for what's called a presidential management internship which is, uh, and I managed to win it, and it's, it's for people who want careers in the federal government. And it's a highly competitive thing, and, and so I tried to get a job at the FDA with this division. <laughs> and um, I didn't even know they existed as a thing. I just wanted to be, you know, in this FDA. And it turned out that they wanted me there because they're a reactive agency. You know, they don't do their own studies, they review studies. And since their attitude was changed, they wanted people in the psychedelic research community to know, okay, you can start submitting applications. So I almost got a job at the FDA. I was willing to give up drugs to do it. <laughs> um, but the DEA got in my way yet again, because I had previously been involved suing the DEA uh, for, for criminalizing MDMA. And so this branch at the FDA, the people there, they said, you know, we can't quite let you in the door. I would have had to wear a suit and a tie and 
all this stuff, but they said, we will advise you um, informally on how to work best with FDA. So that, that, and then we've been creating precedents throughout the years. So now we're in a much stronger position and they've got this precedent that psychedelics and marijuana should be reviewed like any other drug, that there's no special risk. The FDA are really used to dealing with risks. They used to opiates for pain so that they have the authority. And so where who's the president and who's not really doesn't filter down to these divisions plus the precedents. And this idea also that you asked about is that there is now more of a receptivity towards this kind of research. There's less resistance in the scientific community. There's, again, it's because we're talking about helping people who are scared of dying. We're talking about helping veterans. We're, we're, and there's a general sense by a lot of people that things are not going well the way they should be going, that the pharmaceutical industry can't be completely trusted to have your best welfare in mind. And so there's kind of this um, balance. There's also this other factor, which is the aging of the baby boomers. So time is actually on our side for a brief, you know, next 10, 15 years, because there are a lot of people who have given up psychedelics, used them in college, given them up in order to get jobs, have families, have careers, and now they're in their 50s, in their 60s, and they want to see something happen with psychedelics. So psychedelic retirement and, you know, psychedelic hospice. And it's true when people start thinking at the end of their lives more spiritually. So there's, we're seeing a lot of people now who have resources, who have institutional credibility. Roland Griffiths is the best example of that. His whole career was um, involved with uh, NIDA-funded neuroscience research. Now, near the end of his career, he's like, you know, one of the leaders of psychedelic research. So I think that we're fairly fortunate, but I, I should say, and I know it's kind of a long answer, but part of the reason for the international strategy is if there is a backlash in any one country or in the U.S., we will have some surviving studies. So that's why it's really important, you know, that we start something in Australia, that we start it elsewhere just for political insurance in case there's a backlash. Just a quick question about your yeah. protocols. Um, I believe you're not, uh, you don't have problems with drug aware versus drug naive or MDMA, previous MDMA self-medicators in your trials, is that correct? And then the second one is, would you have any issues with people on SSRIs or in uh, any contemporary current yeah. kind of pharmacotherapy? Yeah, um, well the, the, first, the second question is easier to answer, is that um, people have to withdraw from SSRIs to be in the study. Um, SSRIs do mute the effects of MDMA also. Uh, basically, we want people's symptoms to come back. I mean, we want them to, to have the, the sort of masking of the symptoms removed so that they're motivated in a way to work hard to, because it's not ecstasy. It's not you take MDMA and it's all ecstasy and your problems are like, don't matter. You know, people go through extremely painful situations under the influence of MDMA, but they do it with this kind of overlay of reduced fear. and. We, we sort of need to bring things to the surface to teach people that they can deal with these difficult emotions. So we, we do have people withdraw from all the SSRIs. Um, this question about prior use of MDMA. Initially, the FDA said that they wanted only people who had prior exposure to MDMA, even in our PTSD study. And we were able to say that that's not very representative of the population of people with PTSD. Furthermore, it's not likely that there is going to be neurotoxicity. It's not likely that there is going to be any kind of significant harms that these people are going to then become addicted to MDMA. That we argued that we need to really work with people who are MDMA naive, although they can have had prior MDMA experiences, but not within the last six months. And we don't want to work with people who have had, you know, 150 MDMA experiences either. So we have kind of an upper limit that's not that high, like five or ten. But um, so far, what we're finding is that even people who reported to having taken MDMA before in a therapeutic setting, it's much different for them. First off, it's pure. It's fun. You know, Dave Nichols made it. The MDMA we used, by the way, was made in 1985. I had it made in 1985 for $4 a gram. How much you had made? Uh, well, I had a, a kilogram made. Uh, Dave, Dave got great yield and he got two kilograms. <laughs> so it was $2 a gram. <laughs> and it's just sitting there. We've hardly used any of it. So we, you know. 
not to get out, uh, get ahead of ourselves, but um, post the MDMA studies, um, have you got plans for um, future um, uh, studies of psychedelics, and how would you be pitching their therapeutic potential? Well, uh, first of the answer is not just future plans, but we have other studies as well ongoing right now. So we've got um, the first study in 35 years with the therapeutic use of LSD, and that's taking place in Switzerland with uh, people with anxiety associated with end-of-life issues. We also have a study that we were able to start at Harvard Medical School with MDMA for advanced-stage cancer patients. So we are looking at helping people with end-of-life as well with MDMA and LSD, and then Hefter Research Institute has studies with psilocybin at uh, Johns Hopkins, NYU, and then they just published a study with Charlie Grove at UCLA. So those are the two main avenues. One is end of life, one is PTSD. Um, it, it's like, I, I think of MAPS in a way as like a mutual fund. You know, you have to, we have to have a research portfolio that's diversified. And part of what we need is one study at least looking at the treatment of drug abuse because we have to say that we're aware of drug abuse and we're trying to respond to it. So we're doing a, right now what's called an observational study of Ibogaine in the treatment of opiate addiction at Ibogaine clinics in Mexico. Uh, we're also hoping to start a clinical study with Ibogaine. And we had some discussions before about patents and non-patents. Um, the fellow Howard Lotsoff patented Ibogaine for the treatment of opiate addiction in the 80s. And what we saw happen, unfortunately, was a whole bunch of people suing each other over what they thought was monetary gains that they could make from either um, Ibogaine or nor Ibogaine. So the whole Ibogaine community got totally destroyed by the, the quest for private, pers you know, personal private gain in this patent. Now those patents have finally expired. So now we're thinking more about trying to get into clinical studies with Ibogaine. Um, as I described before about end, uh, couples therapy, that would be a terrific use of MDMA, but it's not so linked you know, to pathology, so we don't have the resources for that, so we're not thinking about that. Um, psilocybin for obsessive compulsive disorder showed promise, but we don't have the resources to continue that. So we are looking primarily at MDMA PTSD, but we're trying to facilitate and help other studies. And part of this work with the LSD and the MDMA for end of life and watching the psilocybin is really to double check, is, this, is MDMA for PTSD really the best strategy to go fast? Maybe it's psilocybin for end of life. The, the people at Johns Hopkins are now working with psilocybin for nicotine addiction in combination with other non-drug therapies for nicotine addiction. There's a team that at NYU is going to look at psilocybin for alcoholism. So there are a lot of other things to potentially look at, but I think it's kind of essential that we really target and focus on where we think we can make the most progress. I'm sorry, we're starting to run short of time, oh. but one quick, oh. quick, and quick oh. question. Oh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I realized I ran the risk of people never talking to me again. <laughs> okay, so uh, very we brief. We don't want that. No, we don't want that. Um, Rick, so PTSD study in Australia, do you see that being led kind of by a leading um, psychiatrist in an academic institution? How, how do you see that working practically, you know, in the next year, two years? Well, um, that, that is a big question is, first up, should it be institutionally based? I mean, my, my first thought, again, for Australia, we, we were recently contacted just about a month and a half ago by an Australian veteran with PTSD and wanted to know if he could volunteer to be in our U.S. study. Um, and we said that's not practical, it's not possible, you have to be there for three and a half months, but maybe we could start something in Australia. So my, my first inclination would be to work with veterans with PTSD. So I think that's where there's the most social support. And, and ideally, if we could do it in an institutional setting with some sort of military cooperation, um, that would be ideal. And, but, but again, we'll just have to see how much resistance there is, how much openness there is. Um, I should say that, that if we do get permission in the Canadian study in the near future, which I, I think we will, there's a psychologist uh, who is a psychologist for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police who wants to refer subjects to us. So that's part of that same kind of thing. It's like, who are these drugs for? If there are four people in the mainstream, if these drugs can actually help police 
you know, and, and the way that that happened is that um, Valerie, who's the deputy director of MAPS, Valerie Mojeka, was calling me from the MAPS office. I live in Boston, the office is in uh, Santa Cruz. And she was just explaining how um, around the office, there was all sorts of police all over the place because somebody had been murdered a couple houses away. And it was a pregnant woman who had been murdered. And it just got me thinking how hard that would be to be a police officer to discover something like that, what, what it must be for the police. I, I almost never have sympathy for the police. <laughs> you know, but, and then that afternoon, I got a call from someone who was from Canada. He said that he was interested in learning about our Ibogaine study, which we had initially started to try to do um, in Vancouver. And he asked some questions about how we were doing it. And then he said, I just have to tell you, I work for the police. I'm a psychologist for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And I was just primed. And I said, well, do you guys you know, work with police officers with PTSD? And he said, yeah, we do, lots. So, so, that, so that's what I'm saying. For here, if we could work with the military, with vets, um, that, that's the ideal direction, I think.